Brothers and sisters, we seek the protection of Allah as we gather together in his name and remembrance as he has called us in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, the chapter in which the people will gather on this special day of Friday. And Alhamdulillah, we come together in thanks and gratitude for being given life and everything in it. And the most important blessing we have is guidance. We have a preserved reference point for the truth of life, the purpose and meaning of morality, and the path that leads to eternity. It is crucial for us as believers to constantly be seeking knowledge. And today I want to talk about how and why we seek knowledge and look at a very profound reference that, for whatever reason, a lot of people aren't aware of this reference of knowledge. Knowing the background of where we get our understanding of Islam from is empowering. It leads to a different level of growth. Islam is not just some simple set of beliefs and rules that we live by. The human element of interpreting the Quran and the Sunnah has been a very fundamental part of understanding Islam since the death of the Prophet ﷺ. While the Prophet ﷺ was alive, people could go to him and say, what does this ayah mean? What should we do? And even then, while he was alive, there are a handful of circumstances in which they left him, and the people who left him said, we understood him to be saying this, and the other one said, we understood him to be saying that. And then when he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we've had people interpreting the religion since that time. As a new Muslim 23 years ago, I was learning from people at the mosque, reading books, translations of the Quran and Hadith. At the time, I did not realize that in fact, those sources of Islam that I was reading from are rooted in the interpretations of people with different backgrounds and experiences that influenced their interpretations. Alhamdulillah, in the year 2002, I was blessed with a journey to seek the knowledge from our great scholars. And Alhamdulillah, the path that Allah blessed me with was rich. I sat with scholars from Egypt, from Libya, from Saudi Arabia, from Syria, from Kuwait, from Morocco, from Ghana, and not only did they have obviously these cultural, ethnic differences in their background, but they had various schools of thought and approaches to um, teaching the religion. So these socioeconomic realities they had surely had some impact in the way they looked at things. So this opened my eyes and challenged me to find where I settle. Do I blindly follow this one? or that one, who made that one or this one the one I should follow? It was easy, the political dynamic over a hundred years ago, when nation states weren't even really, you know, nation states, but areas, there wasn't a lot of exchange of information and travelers from afar didn't come in in massive groups. And so they tried to just keep everybody to stick with those local scholars and the way they understand it, their school of thought. And now we live in a world where everybody's meeting everybody and speaking to everybody. And now we have Sheikh Al-Allama Google <laughs> at our fingertips. So people can be confused. And so Alhamdulillah, after a few years in my path of seeking knowledge, I did notice that I guess it's just a, for some people it works that way. Some people found themselves really focusing on only one school of thought or one sheikh or a group of sheikhs from one country. And they started like basically saying everything that comes from that way of understanding. And they're not aware of other interpretations. And for some strange reason, they don't want to hear it as though Islam is teaching some sort of uh, divisional, tribalistic understanding of Islam. This is definitely not what Islam teaches. So when we take our knowledge of Islam from the English internet, 
the responses to Google when you go in there asking about information is quite different when you go on the internet and you look something up in Arabic. You look something up in Arabic, you're going to get a much wider variety of ideas than whenever you look in English. English is going to have two groups pretty much monopolizing whatever it is that you take in because of their strong influence and their desire to promote their way through the digital age since the 2000s started. And that is the Saudi Arabian movement known as Salafiyya and the Diobendi Darul Uloom um, group that is calling to this modernized Hanafi way of understanding Islam and so forth. So you'll find that you're, narrow, you're narrowed down to two countries scholars, India, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia here with this, and whoever would follow them, whether they're in South Africa or Egypt or wherever, they're actually going back to them. They're, they're just followers. And so that limits us, that limits our scope. Now, those scholars from Saudi Arabia are scholars, very pious, probably most of them more pious than myself, and we're not here to criticize anybody. We're just simply helping you understand the framework, right? Same thing with India and Pakistan, very pious scholars devoted their life to the religion. I just wanna make sure that you understand that that is narrowing your access to the understanding of Islam. And so those scholars from both of those places are unquestionably influenced by the socio-political realities of their country in the last hundred years. And that influences how they prioritize and what kind of things that they're teaching. And so for that reason, we have to follow the Quran when it tells us, and we only sent men in history with revelations teaching people the message. This is the prophets. If you don't know exactly what those prophets taught or you don't understand it, then you should, you're commanded to by Allah, fas'alu, ask those people of the knowledge of this revelation. Meaning what? Any and all of them, so that you will have deeper, richer knowledge. There is no teaching anywhere in the Quran and the Sunnah that you must find only one teacher or one school of thought and follow it. That is a political dynamic that was developed to keep the peace in localities. When foreign people came through, they didn't want to create some big dis disruption of the society's religious understanding. And so that's why they developed that idea. It's not some teaching of Islam. It's more of a political comfort zone in how we understand religion in certain localities before the world started traveling everywhere and exchanging information in such very direct ways with such very direct access. The Prophet ﷺ said, The scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. They inherit that knowledge and then they explain it. And they teach it to us. Again, all scholars. And then the Prophet ﷺ told us a beautiful thing. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah will send to my followers every hundred years some scholar that will revive and re-establish a proper understanding of the religion for the people that is relative and relevant to their reality. Why is the Prophet ﷺ saying this and why is Allah doing this? Because as Imam al-Shafi'i pointed out in his treatise on Islamic jurisprudence, Kitab al-Um, that al-fatawa wa tatbiq al-shara' tatagayyir hasb al-makan wa zaman wa dhuruf. That the legal rulings and application of divine law and the priorities of understanding and living Islam will definitely be different and change according to the time, place, and circumstances in which the people to whom it's applied are living. This is an understanding for 13 centuries established by the founding schools of thought. And so today I want to talk about one of those great scholars who was definitely a mujaddid a reviver of a proper understanding of Islam. 
he was perhaps one of the greatest, if not the greatest scholar um, of the 20th century. And his name is Muhammad al-Tahir ibn Ashur. Muhammad al-Tahir ibn Ashur, he was born in what is now called Tunis. And he was born in 1879. And he lived to 1973. He lived 94 years. And his life is filled with an immense amount of scholarship and great writings and teachings and students. Imam Ibn Ashur actually comes from a family that had to escape Al-Andalus whenever the Pope called for the inquisition of removing all Muslims from Spain. And so his family went down and they moved to North Africa and they are a family of scholars for many generations, going back to um, Al-Andalus because he was, you know, obviously his family was there 500 years before when they sent them out. And they have that chain of transmission. It's a very, we are Ummatul Isnad. We're the nation of attributing through a known transmission, who you took knowledge from, where you took knowledge, and how that was taken. So Ibn Ashur, as a young boy, he memorized the Quran, studied the Islamic sciences. He was seen as a genius. By the time he was 14, they said, we just have to just move him past whatever elementary and middle school and put them into the college of Az-Zaytuna, which at that time had actually become, according to Muhammad Abdu, who was the Mufti of Egypt in 1907, uh, Zaytuna was the epic top Islamic jurisprudence uh, center in North Africa, even over Qarawiyyim. And so he went in there at 14 years old, and by the time he was 18, he graduated with honors, and they made him a teacher for first and second year uh, students who were pretty much all either his age or a little bit older than him because of his um, quickness to learn. So by the time he was 27, after that, so this is nine years later, he was made dean of the curriculum development because he kept challenging certain hand-me-down, cut-and-paste um, treatises that he found problems with and he challenged and he made, he brought his evidence. So they said, you just need to write a new curriculum for us. And so he then wrote a new curriculum for the entire college of Az-Zaytuna in the Islamic sciences. And by the time he was uh, 42 years old, he was appointed as Grand Sheikh of Zaytuna and the Mufti of the lands where he was of all of the uh, scholars there, they appointed him as the top. By the time he was 50 years old, he was given the title by many of his contemporaries from Morocco to West Africa, all the way to Damascus and Halab and Lebanon and Palestine and so forth as Sheikh al-Islam. They gave him the title Sheikh al-Islam, which only a handful of scholars in our history were given such a title. Everybody mostly knows Ibn Taymiyyah. He was one of them. Um, uh, there are many Sheikh al-Islams, uh, but they are definitely very rare. And what that means is, Sheikh al-Islam, it means in any subject you could talk about from the various subjects of Islamic uh, theology, whether it be creed, whether it be jurisprudence, whether it be hadith sciences or history or whatever you want to talk about, this Sheikh can give you authoritative knowledge in which he can talk forever from his mind and bring you all the evidences and the historical references on the subject. Because most people, like anything, they go into one field, hadith, and they become hadith scholar. But if you ask him about tafsir, he'll say, well, I've heard about that. I have some general knowledge on that, but I'm not specialized there. You might go to Sheikh so-and-so, right? So he was given that title of Sheikh al-Islam. He was undoubtedly one of a handful of the revivers that we had. And he wrote many, many books and many, many research papers, but there's two that stand out very uniquely, and that is a tahrir wa tanweer, which is his tafsir, which is many volumes. And in this tafsir, he completely revived and renovated the entire notion of tafsir. Basically, um, the uh, academic um, establishment in the illumination of the understanding of expounding upon the Quran. And then he has his book, Maqasidu Shari'atul Islamiya, the objectives and necessities of the Islamic law, the overarching principles and objectives for Islamic law. In the, each of these books, in the intro, he highlights two important points why he says the Muslim Ummah 
has fallen, right? And so tonight we're going to go into his sirah in more detail, you know, kind of walk through it in more of a, each step of the road, and you'll see um, how he dealt with it. But, you know, in one point is, is that he and his teachers as Zaytuna, they didn't want to deal with the fact that the kind of ruling figures had just gone along with French colonization and just be like, let's fight them and kill them, these evil kuffar. They wanted to analyze how did this happen? How did we get in a situation where we're so weak that they can just come in here and then our leaders will just naturally go along with them? And then like, what happened? Like, what led to this? There's something under, if we just fight them, they seem to be very, you know, well established, you know, we are obviously not in a position to fight them. So we have to intellectualize the situation and bring a solution from the religion to solve these problems. And so he said, number one, that the academic nature of religion has moved from intellectualizing, comparing opinions and ijtihad uh, to just this cut and paste parroting amongst people who are called scholars. He said, it's very normal for an average person who's not trained in the sciences of Islam to say, here's my understanding, here's the opinion I follow, and that's what it is. And so I got that from this sheikh. But for a scholar to say that, he said, was a divergence from the historical um, uh, tradition that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ took, and that those great scholars that established the schools of thought that we have, how they taught their students, and what kind of development happened in their schools of thought over many centuries. So he highlights that as a fundamental point that people cannot explain to you who are called scholars, they can't explain to you the religion in any sort of sophisticated analysis. They'll just simply quote to you quotes and just basically tell you, I'm Sheikh, you're not, here's the quote, follow because I said so, right? And he's saying this is a big problem uh, in our ummah. And then he said that what happened as a result of this kind of what Jumud al-Fikri, what he calls it, this stagnant thought process is that it solidified division amongst Muslims into their various schools of thought and they're following these uh, people blindly. Because if people can't have a healthy discourse, then they're just going to default and just stay with their group and tribalize themselves as Muslims, right? So he said that has led to a big problem. He said, spiritually, we went from genuine self-awareness and the fight against ourselves in the purification and refinement process that is seeking knowledge and giving and taking advice and pondering over revelation and creation and, and then becoming a person of word and deed that brings goodness to the world as a result of this spiritual process. He said, then we went to uh, a very widespread phenomenon of people taking their spirituality from some sort of mystical blind following of a man who's having dreams, claiming in his dreams such and such said, doing repeti repetitive things that are not mentioned anywhere in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and jumping up and down and spinning around in circles. And he said, this is now the nature of so many millions of Muslims, spiritually speaking. So if you have intellectual decadence and spiritual decadence, and you're called Muslims, submitters to the will of God, anyone can destroy you because you have a huge hypocrisy as your functional reality. So that's Ibn Ashur's insight into the state of the Muslims back in the early 19th uh, or the 1900s. So I wanted to highlight a couple of powerful statements he made that are holistically representing the approach of reviving Islam. He said, number one, justice is, was, and always will be the basis for building a community. He said, justice is how this earth was created. And he says, it is how we must govern our society. He said, there are two conditions for a society to have justice. And that that society then could reign and thrive and last for a long time. He said, that's freedom and brotherhood. He said, if freedom is claimed without justice, then the nation will definitely dwindle and fall because then there will be a hypocrisy there. You see, oh, we have freedom, but then there's no justice. Like here in America, as we see ourselves falling um, rapidly. And then he said, this means that if we're truly having freedom, it means when I take my rights, I'm doing that with one eye on what I deserve and the other eye assuring that my fellow citizens have what they deserve and that there is a sense of fair treatment to everyone, and I perceive as a citizen or as a political governance figure that one person's rights being taken 
is like everyone's rights being taken. Sounds like a familiar modern quote by Martin Luther King Jr. He said that long before him. Um, so Alhamdulillah, we have this history in our community. Unfortunately, certain powers that be have suppressed these type voices. And you can imagine why, if you think about it, um, why you don't get to hear about people like Ibn Ashur. Um, and so then he says that brotherhood, uh, brotherhood it, it is uh, that uh, a nation comes together and genuinely looks after each other and cares for each other on a personal level. But if there are political or even religious notions of pitting people against each other, then you cannot have brotherhood, right? And that's why I'm of the position and have been very firm about this for, I'm gonna say 12 years now, 13 years, that all of these groups, I'm sure that when they started, they had a good intention because the Muslim community has fallen. You see this group and that group and this group and this you know, way of thinking and these sheikhs who claim this title of their group, all of those are a big problem because while they have good qualities and focuses and priorities, they all divide Muslims. That's what they're doing. They are dividing Muslims and seeing one person, whether they say so or not, they feel like I'm on the right path, my group, my way is right, and those are wrong. No matter what they say, if you, if you sit with them and visit with them and read their literature, you will find it comes down to that, right? So as a Muslim, we should all try to seek knowledge. We should all make sure that our creed is rooted in the Quran and the Sunnah. We should all make sure that we know the authenticity of the Hadith. We should all make sure that we are purifying our heart and reflecting and remembering God on a daily basis and correcting our words and correcting our actions. We should all be inviting people to the mosque. We should all be politically active. We should be doing all of these things and what those things are are actions of Muslims. If you separate them into groups, then we basically uh, become working against each other. So that's Ibn Ashur, mashallah, solving that problem before it got out of hand, but nobody listened. So then he says, the religious revival necessitates looking into reforming the actions of believers towards holistic benefit of the entire world. He said, Islam came to bring comprehensive benefit to everyone, rahmatan lil alameen. The entire purpose for the Prophet Sallallahu being sent is that the whole world and everything in it will feel from his message and his followers a sense of benefit, a sense of reform, repair, goodness, wellness, concern for their well-being, benevolence, right? So he's saying, if we're going to revive the religion, then we have to have that as our top priority. What are we doing to make the world a better place? So bring the interpretations, the eyes and the hadith that have been somehow lost or marginalized and focus on that. And he makes the point that you'll think most people religiously think however many ayahs I memorized and recited and how many rak'ahs I prayed and how many days I fasted extra, that makes me the great Muslim. And they didn't do anything for anyone but themselves. And if they were understanding why those things, they are the one they're worshiping by all of his asma was sifat, should then lead them to be this person that benefits the world. So he says, this is first from the angle of returning how we think about religion to its original prophetic foundations and looking at the companions of the Prophet wasallam and their priorities. And the companions had very different angles and they had all kinds of uh, collective priorities. And then he says, this will change the priorities of action among believers to that which benefits the world. And on the larger scale, we will have to then look into the system of governance in which we live and create a desire so that governance would be in everybody's best interest. If you would like to learn a little bit deeper about Ibn Ashur, Rahimullah Ta'ala, um, tonight after Isha, we will go maybe 30, 45 minutes into his seerah a little bit deeper. But the point I want to make is that saying one is Muslim is much deeper than having some beliefs and doing some rituals. It should represent something much deeper. The world is a broken place. The world has a lot of standardized corruption. Falsehood is seen as true. Truth is seen as falsehood. 
those people who are damaging the best interests of this world have the most power. And at the end of the day, the grassroots is where the Prophet ﷺ gained his power. He empowered his followers, his companions. He could have called them disciples, right? Talamith, Tulab, however you want to put it. But he said Ashab. And Allah referred to them as that. Because they really were companions. They cared for each other. And they were pushing each other in the right direction. And they were on a mission. One of the things that a lot of people don't pay attention to is that the companions were being literally attacked for being Muslim. And so one of the priorities because of that notion that wherever I go, somebody may try to kill me and somebody might assassinate our prophet and somebody may destroy our land and take it over in the imperial world we live in. They had a priority of fighting wars and having a military and they should have, who wouldn't? Which rational person would say, no, they should have just walked around with flowers and then been killed and then none of us are sitting here today. You see what I'm saying? Don't, don't get fooled by the nonsense. But if you look at when Islam was settled and had strength, the priority shifted to civilizational development. And what's really unfortunate is that a large number of Muslims, as we've been talking about for the last few weeks, are not aware of their own history. And this world we live in is trying to make us feel bad about being Muslim. It has developed, cultivated, and taken advantage of political realities that have been thrust on Muslims for centuries and made us to believe that, oh, that's what Islam is, you know, this thing that looks scary and bad and no good. And so we cannot fall into that. We definitely have to develop a congregation of people and work together. That's another thing. Muslims historically were always about going to the mosque and the mosque was always a central place of growth and development, leadership, movement, knowledge, prioritizing how we deal with the social issues of the day. Since those people left our lands and remote controlling by the people they put in power, they wanted to make the mosque the most simplest of places where you just go pray. And if somebody wants to teach something, it cannot be a movement of moral impact. Because then that will do what? Threaten their corrupt power. And it will, because their corrupt power has been rooted in those who gave them that power. And those are not Muslims, right? And so here we live in this beautiful opportunity known as America. Don't get caught up in the fast lane of the hamster wheel. So we hope, inshallah, that people will come to the daily salah more often, get to know their fellow believers, build relationships, bond, Seek knowledge. Don't be scared to learn something new. Don't be scared to change. Change is the natural order of things. Change means you're growing. If you're not changing as a human being, then you've become like the animals. If you watch these animals out here, once they get to a certain level, they do the exact same thing every day because they are not intellectual people with a purpose outside of just creating an ecosystem to live in. We are different. And that's what Tajdeed is all about, reviving that beautiful prophetic notion. Ya Allah, we ask you to revive in our hearts and our minds, in our communities and our families, the notion of prophetic guidance and wisdom. Ya Allah, we ask you to bring our hearts together in a love for you and your message and a love for your beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, we ask your forgiveness for all of us, those of us who are strong and those of us who are weak. We ask you to empower us with this message and empower us as a community of people so that your light can shine to the world around us. Ya Allah, send your peace and blessings and mercy on your final messenger, Muhammad, and aqim as-salah.